Let's see how it looks. So it looks like Liz is first with eight inch floppy disks. Yeah, so this is old news, but it's still it's still sort of timely. It's not as old as the uh, technology that the uh, government's using. Um, and, and there's a good little bit of foreshadowing in this article. It's from October. Uh, and it's this, the main story is about uh, how, how they're finally switching off of uh, eight inch floppies for um, one of the uh, munition systems, <laughs> which that's, that's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't, you know, our, our, uh, we knew that we were using obsolete tech for some of our um, critical systems. Oh, yeah. Aided floppies for our nukes is a little insane. So apparently they finally got off of this, but I thought it was interesting that uh, the one line that really jumped out to me from this article was that uh, the Government Accountability Office released a uh, damning report about the continued use of obsolete technology by Uncle Sam, including ancient mainframes and critical applications written in COBOL. Uh, six months later, you can see how well that's working out. Yeah, yeah. This is why, you know, that's why I changed my background. I wrote a COBOL CTF. I'm hoping they'll let me teach COBOL. Cobalt is apparently coming back. Or well, still here. The, only the only time I've ever, ever had any experience with it whatsoever was uh, when I was working in a uh, government office some years ago. Yep. That's the only time I've ever seen it in use. So, uh, pretty interesting. You know, I'm as old as the hills. And when I first learned programming in the 70s, they said, oh, forget Cobalt, it's over. But no, <laughs> it will never die. Yeah, so uh, just the, the old tech, it won't die. Yeah, all right. And Docker servers, uh oh, the so Docker servers are under attack. There's a uh, malware out hunting for anything that has uh, some extra ports open, like the API ports exposed to the internet without a password. Wait a minute, uh, it, exposed to the yeah. internet without a password. What is that a default or something? I think it is. Who could? Actually, who could I don't know. To be honest, I don't know because I, I depend on DigitalOcean a lot who yeah. sets up the firewall correctly where you only have a few things that are open and, and everything else you have to put a rule in. Yeah, that's what I'd like to know is how do you end up with a some port open with no password? What system would do that? I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, it gets in, gathers local SSH credentials to try to keep spreading or, you know, affecting other cloud systems. Yeah. Uh, it, it's been around for a while, since 2018, but it's picking up steam. Hmm. Okay. We're, you know, we're moving everything cloud-based. Oh, yeah, everything's in Docker, but I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah. And then the magic toilet, I saw this one. This is awesome. Yes, it is awesome. So... Let me give a little bit of a uh, precursor to this. Uh, on April 1st, I decided it would be hilarious to buy a bunch of fake cameras and put them in the bathroom. And I had like two cameras staring at the toilet and two cameras staring in the, in the shower. It was hilarious. One of my housemates thought it was real and I had to talk to the authorities for a little bit, which was fantastic. They called the uh, cops? That's awesome. Yes, I know. It was amazing. It was the perfect April Fool's joke. Anyway, um, and then this shows up. They're actually talking about putting cameras in our toilets. And they're going to use it. And, and so there's a few things that they, that they want to do with it. They want to have the toilets kind of look up your, your pooper and be able to ID you based on your, your anus. And um, a new form of uh, biometrics. Yeah, yeah, a new form of biometrics <laughs> using, using your, your, your poop, poop shoot. And um, they, don't, they also want to use it to kind of gauge your health by like looking at what's coming out. It's an amazing violation of privacy. I love it. The patent drawings are hilarious. <laughs> Would that be PII? I'm... Uh, it's definitely P. PII or PU. You know, I read a friend of mine moved to Germany years ago and he sent me German toilets. It is apparently so common in Germany for people to examine their poop to see to check their health that they have special toilets that leave it on a shelf so you can see it before it flushes. This is like greatly believed that you should monitor this carefully there. So this this would probably be popular there anyway. Well, 
I have never heard of any like medical evidence of whether there is something you can really tell from this, but maybe we'll know soon. Mm -hmm. So, so do you have a police record yet from these April Fool's jokes? I mean, that's not, a... no, no. So they didn't, they didn't call the cops. Thankfully, they, they called some other people in authority. Um, oh, okay. Lesser. I, I can't believe anyone would live with you for longer than five minutes and you not. Know, <laughs> you know, I, the thing is, is that my, my joke was totally obvious. I had stickers on the wall saying, you know, violators will be prosecuted. It was. Mo I have a few housemates. They all, most, all of them went in and just laughed. One housemate, I think, is just not <laughs> as uh, astute as the others. So, some people just got no respect for humor. Yes. All right. So, so this hit the news all over the place, and I read this thing. Um, this is a serious article in the Lancet, which is a serious journal, and they're saying that you make things worse by closing the schools. Talking about K through twelve which at first sounded crazy to me, but I sort of understood it a little more as I went down here. Uh, the point is, if your children are not in school, then they still go out and play and perhaps get infected, and now the parents can't go to work, so you have less healthcare professionals able to go out there. And so they did a study saying what kind of disease is improved by closing the schools and what kind is not. And apparently the current influenza, uh, the um, the COVID-19 is the wrong kind, where closing the schools makes things worse. Um, and here's this, this number, R greater than two. Uh, school closing is valuable if the virus has a low transmissibility and a high attack rate in children. And this is the opposite. So um, anyway, it's an interesting issue. Uh, this is not a very impressive study. All they did was study the previous publications about it. But anyway, I was just uh, discussing this with a friend of mine, and I think that we're seeing the rates of infection go down. They closed the schools, they closed everything, that worked. I think we all expect a bigger outbreak of this in the fall, and I'm sure they will just repeat the same thing that worked last time. I certainly would, rather than experimenting. But anyway, maybe closing the K through 12 schools was not a good idea, but I expect it'll happen again. Anyway, you know. yeah. I think it's hard for them to have accurate transmissibility figures to even go off of. Um, so this is sort of a inherently flawed study because um, it's not like they were testing all the school kids with reliable tests to know how many actually had it. So well, I don't know how valuable this is. Well, perhaps, but I think the historical ones, you finally do have evidence of what worked and what didn't. But um, Another thing, I was really hoping for the antibody tests, but I just read in Britain, those things are horrible. They have a 60% chance of being right. So they're no better than flipping a coin. So apparently the technology for that is not as good as they expected. And there are not any antibody tests coming out that are really gonna do us any good. I wonder how the ones they're working on at Stanford are coming along or compared to the other ones. All these tests seem to have been much more, harder to, much more harder to make than they thought. So yeah. They rolled them out and then decided they were no good. Anyway, uh, so students biometric data. Oh, Google. Oh, yes. Yes. So I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, a pair, a uh, pair of Illinois school kids um, are suing Google through their dad. Uh, and and I think that this is this is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's going to have the desired effect which is for um, companies like Google to just stop collecting data. I think that they'll probably just railroad parents into signing permission slips to allow it. But um, they're it's, doing face scans of children. I didn't know about scans that. and they're doing voice prints, which is kind of insane. Uh, considering the fact that we, we knew uh, a couple of years ago, we learned from Baidu that they could essentially make a deep fake of you uh, talking on the phone with uh, just 30 se seconds of um, 30 seconds of voice sampling from you. Um, so it's, Why are it's they doing of, it? I haven't had my face or my voice recovered by Google. Why are they doing it to children? Uh, they're doing it through their Chromebook program. And I think it's just because that's what Google does now. They're a data collection uh, conglomerate. Um, so if I bought a Chromebook, they would record my face and voice print. What use it to log? Well, I don't know if it's if they do that to just general users or if this is part of uh, just their um, 
you know, I'm sure they put specific software for uh, school programs on their on the Chromebooks. Well, okay. Well, that's interesting. Come well, I don't know if this is school kids specific spyware or if it's uh, applicable to just anybody that buys a Chromebook, but I would suspect it's the former. I would I imagine it's probably just using it for logging in or something. Which, uh, Google Classroom, that's, yeah. So it's through through Google Classroom that does it. Well, I can see how it'd be a whole lot better than expecting them all to remember passwords and have some kind of password reset process and stuff. Sure, and drive the teacher nuts every 30 seconds. But um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see how this, I'm, I'm interested to see how this unfolds. Yeah, another one like that coming up. But here's uh, the COVID-19 scams. Of course, there's a ton of them. Yep, a ton, of, a ton of them, and this article kind of shows you a few of the ones that have been happening, like people getting texts, and <coughs> like a mandatory online test, because, you know, just like you got to study for a blood test. Interesting. Online uh, test. <laughs> malicious macros, uh, rats hiding as uh, the small oh. association. Uh, we talked about Zeus. You know, that online test is pretty much what Trump announced a month ago. Google's going to make an online COVID scanning tool. That's more plausible than you might think. Yeah, and a couple of others, like the uh, wiper that takes out the MBR. Mm -hmm. if, the, uh, if the actual lab tests are flawed, I can't wait to see what kind of steaming dumpster fire of trash uh, that app is going to be. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's just a quick roundup of, of things that, that are being seen now around the web. Yeah. And here's phishing campaigns. Yep. So I, before I get started, I do need to point out that this is being put out by NCC Group, who coincidentally makes money um, from, you know, protecting people from phishing campaigns. Uh, so they apparently had, done, they did statistics from 1,300 phishing campaigns and found that um, uh, one in 10, in best case, one in 10 targets will actually click. So if you send out an, a phishing email, one in 10 will click and one in 20 will supply credentials. That is much higher than I was expecting. I thought, oh, maybe one in a hundred, maybe a hundred, one, one in 150 might, might, no, best case one in 20. Yeah. And, and we were all talking about how great, how nice it was that these uh, people, these criminals were, were going to stop going after the health sector for a while. Well, it turns out that the health sector is actually one of the strongest industries uh, not to click on, on phishing emails. Mm -hmm. One of the, the, one of the industries that's most likely to click on, on phishing emails uh, are charities. And education, apparently. I was gonna say, school has got to be up there. Yeah. And, 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 and education. And defense, even worse than charity. That's charming. Oh, yes, of course. It's the lowest. Yep, yep, well, that, that's interesting information. IT is the lowest. Well, that makes some sense. The people <laughs> actually know you shouldn't do this. Right. It better be the lowest. I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Well, that's yeah, that's nice to get those numbers and compare the different areas. So, so this I thought I was really quite interested in this. Um, I've done some bug bounties, as you know, and made a little bit of money. Not much. I'm not a champ by any means. But um, the they're really picking on these bug bounty programs. My friends who really try to make money doing this are very, very, very disgusted with bug bounty programs. And even Katie Mazuras, who pretty much started them at Microsoft, seems to be pretty much souring on it. Um, and the problem is what essentially happens is it is a way to conceal your vulnerabilities forever and muzzle the researchers. In order to get the money, you have to promise to never tell anybody anything. And then uh, they never want you to reveal it at all. And people feel like they're just basically being bribed to shut up. And that's one I've heard a lot. The other thing I, I mostly hear is that you submit vulnerabilities. They always tell you it's out of scope. They tell you it doesn't matter. They, and uh, anyway, and the other thing is they now make it so the agreement not to prosecute you is dependent on you never telling anybody. So if you ever tweet about it, they can then decide to prosecute. That's a charming one. But the next thing, which is amazing, is these things almost certainly violate the laws. Um, there's, 
they're claiming that if you have a bug bounty program and you don't let people disclose stuff, you have not violated disclosure laws. And mm. they, which I thought is probably true. So you only get safe harbor if you sign the non-disclosure agreement. You're not free from prosecution if you don't. And then um, it violates labor laws. This is the one that I thought's amazing. The bug bounty hunters are now gig workers. And in California, you now have to pay them a salary and benefits and stuff. Uh, that, that is why I've been avoiding the, the bug bounties for so long is because it is exploitative. I mean, people talk about, oh yeah, I made $75,000 on this, on this one exploit, but that's so rare. Yeah, and how long did they, and how much time did they invest to make that money? Exactly. Oh yeah, it's, it's all, ultimately this entire thing is in a strain, and it might violate GDPR because you never disclosed the breach. You hide it, uh, cover it up now. So it really sounds like, um, like most of these disruptive industries, they're running afoul of a lot of laws. So it's pretty interesting to see. Um, and they violate your compliance regulations and stuff. So, you know, I think I see all this as growing pains. You have a new industry sector and it doesn't really fit into the existing legal structures, but it's certainly not an easy way for a normal person to get a pile of money. They claim to have like a hundred thousand hackers on hacker one or something. It's mm -hmm. incredible how many people are trying to do this. And I've seen studies where they make almost no money. Anyway, a couple of people have paid me now and then, but I've never been going, uh, I made a few hundred bucks out of this, but not enough. I certainly don't recommend it as a job. Yeah. But anyway, it's interesting to see. And here's the new ones, the latest bug bounty programs. Um, BMW has a bug bounty program, which sounds like good, clean fun, although it's for their web applications, not the cars. And it's through HackerOne. And the next three are all cryptocurrency companies. And I see a lot of smart people in blockchain and cryptocurrency, and I don't get it. I mean... It's all garbage, isn't it? Is there some value I'm missing? A bunch of smart people seem to still believe in this stuff, whereas I've lost all faith in it. What is the point of blockchain? Am I missing something? Do any of you guys like blockchain? Oh, drugs, drugs, Sam, drugs. Buying drugs. How do blockchains help you buy drugs? <laughs> because you can use Bitcoin to buy drugs and make it somewhat untraceable as opposed to using a credit card. Okay, well, yeah, but, but all these companies are out there. Apparently, a bunch of people are still investing in blockchain companies and higher It'll take off. It's, it's going to take off bigger than Linux on the desktop. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was all garbage, but it hasn't died yet. Anyway, um, all right, so now we're down to Zoom. Of course, everybody's all angry about Zoom. Yeah, I just thought that these were both uh, sort of entertaining articles, but the, the coolest thing uh, to me is that there's a war dialing, uh, there's a war dialer for Zoom, which I haven't been able to find yet, just lots of articles about it, but I want the actual tool to try it out, because this is like... Uh, you know, bringing bringing back some of the uh, some of the most fun games from thirty years ago. So yeah. I know there's there's forums where people post the Zoom their teacher put out oh. so you can find it and bomb it. Yeah, I'm I want the somebody actually built a uh, tool, um, and I, I was looking at some of the wares uh, forums that I may or may not have used to frequent at one point, but I, I still wasn't able to find it. So. Okay. If anyone finds the uh, if anyone finds the Zoom war dialer, let me know. <laughs> All right. And uh, oh yeah, this one, the BGP hack. Yeah. Yeah, the BGP hack that uh, affected financial businesses. Not so much everything else. Yep. For just for an hour. Yeah, it was just for an hour. So but... this seems like a deliberate attack, right? Right. And it's from the same people who've done things like this before, the Ross, Ross Telecom? Rosselcom, yeah. Uh, yes, Rosselcom. Uh, they, yeah, they're the ones who did it again, and, but they struck uh, financial businesses, not, not everybody. Well, you know, I think this shows that we really need, you know, pinned TLS or something like that, uh, where you, you cannot have a fake TLS certificate that's accepted. Right. Because then it, this stuff wouldn't matter. Obviously, they wouldn't keep doing it if there still weren't vulnerable websites, and banks are often very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, 
gravity. Yes, gravity is a thing. Well, yes, yes. And it's, it's a very interesting thing because something's wrong. Um, it does not mesh with uh, quantum mechanics. Oh, well, well okay, yeah. And that, that's been known for a while. Um, and so scientists have recently set up an experiment where they set up this spinning disk and they measured the inverse square law of gravity down to a few micrometers. And it turns out that gravity behaves exactly the same at that scale. Well, I remember when this all started with Isaac Newton and Kepler, they thought it was really outrageous to suggest that since you can rocks like cannonballs fall on Earth, you should expect the same rules to apply out in distant galaxies and stuff, but or, or planets. But that turned out to be true. It is surprising how universal. Surprising how universal. How universal. How universal. It, 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 oh, there's echo. Oh, there's echo. I wonder what caused that. What caused Not I. Is it just me? Is it gone now? Let's see. Really if, it now. if it was okay. that would be awesome. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, so something, so something is is off here. So quantum mechanics ha is sure. extremely reliable. It is doesn't make any sense, but all the equations seem to work, and everything is is in order. Uh, general relativity, probably a little less, you know, as as robust as quantum mechanics, but still very very robust. You know, very robust. Yeah, I mean, it's well understood. It's it's understood well enough. And so you would think that these two would would meld together. You know, quantum mechanics and, and gravity. But no, at the very at the smallest scales, the two seem to conflict. And oh, yeah, yeah, we seem to be getting closer right. to figuring out what's going on. It's yeah. because the Earth is flat. I mean, come oh, on. Yeah, of course. And birds aren't real. There's and you. and five five G is uh, transmitting coronavirus. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all the Clinton uh, Foundation. Okay. You need to take quinine and everything will be fine. Anyway, um, <laughs> all, right. all right. And so I, I went and saw the latest web hacking tools. I thought these look pretty good. Um, this is from Fort Swigger, the guys that make BERT. So Jed, Java deserialization made easy. I don't have any deserialization attacks in my projects because they're all too hard. So I got to check this out. I even had one of my students who got a job as a pen tester saying, hey, do you have a project making it easy to do deserialization? I said, boy, I wish I did. It's annoying. It's a real important vulnerability, but it's hard to set up. And then machine learning to do target discovery. I don't, I'm very skeptical, but anyway, that's an interesting one. And this Please. thing will supposedly detect if people are running deep packet inspection on your packets, which what? I thought everybody was everywhere all the time by now. Hmm. And this one is supposed to stop stuff like the, uh, the rubber ducky. And what Google, this thing will do is it will notice if the key presses are mechanically generated instead of by a human, something about the timing between them and stuff, which is actually pretty clever, which seems to me like a small step from the Google CAPTCHA that detects whether you're a human in subtle ways. This is actually not a bad idea at all. So I have a question. Why yep. can't I make a replay USB where I type in as fast as I can the commands I want to type myself and then save it to a USB and then have that replay it? I'm sure you could, and that would probably stop a version of this. And this is why, you know, if you, re if you submit a talk to DEF CON, they say, if it's an attack, what's the defense and what's the stronger attack? If it's a defense, what's the attack and what's a stronger defense? It's always this way. Everything only blocks a certain generation of attacks, and then there's a more powerful version that will get through. But still, this could stop the existing deployed infrastructure of USB attacks. I mean, this has been around for a while. You can yeah, download programs that will look for key presses that are always, you know, X amount of milliseconds apart. Really? And then just stop it. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, I thought those were fun tools. And the first one, I think I'm really going to have to get into Java deserialization. Good. Any, any more comments? No, no that's pretty interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop the